So, buenos dias to everybody and I am so happy to share some of the information with you all today on herbal medicine standardization and quality control for export of herbal products. Um, all the figures in this presentation are taken from various web sources just to explain the ideas and concepts not to be used for sale or any other purpose except teaching. Um, if uh, some of you attending first time then you know Amo Colombia, Ila, Gente de Aqua, Aqui, Mi Nombre es Yashwan Patak, Actualmente Estoy en United States of America, soy profesor y decano asociado en la Universidad del Sur de Florida, Taneja College Pharmacy, estoy en Colombia como becario Fulbright Special Vilaista. Uh, and I hope by my last lecture I will be able to say all these Spanish things without looking at the <laughs> slides. Sincere thanks to Universidad Distrital. Francisco Jose de Caldas for hosting me as a Fulbright Specialist here in Bogota. My sincere thanks to Rector and Dean and other administrative heads supporting my trip here. My sincere thanks to Fulbright Specialist Commission of Colombia for supporting my trip to Bogota, Colombia. And I will fail if I do not mention my sincere gratitude to Professor Caesar Aurelio Herano Fierro. Uh, being my host and incredible support for making my stay uh, happy here. <clears throat> Special thanks to Reem Abdul Hum and Shannon Fleming of World Learning and Sergio Villamil, Sanchez, Sebastian Villamizar and many other Colombian Fulbright Commission for their kind support. Professors Luis Reyes, Juan C. Cruz, Willy Moreno, Luis Fernando Cruz Quiroga, Special thanks to Professor Alexis Ortiz from International Office of UDFJDC, Alvaro Vasquez and many others and Desde El Fondo de Mi Corazón. My apologies for my Spanish pronunciation and you will understand my Spanish then surely you will understand my English too. Miss Disculpas por Mi Español. So nutraceuticals and herbal drugs, so on the, in the first talk we have seen how they are useful for the chronic diseases and we try to define what are chronic diseases and those who last for one year or more and require ongoing medical attention and limit activities of daily living or both and chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes are the leading cause of death in United States. So there are top 10 chronic diseases we had discussed about it and they are heart disease and stroke, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, alcohol related health issues, obesity, neurodegenerative chronic diseases, smoking related health issues, tooth decay and oral disease and epilepsy. These, all these details we had seen it. So it is observed that if you are above 65 then 68 percent of the people suffer from one of these diseases. When you are above 85, 80% of the people will have at least one or more diseases of this. So all these diseases are directly related to the aging process and directly related to the senior citizens or old age population. And it is very interesting to see the data here which I have shared is that 14% of the people have mental problems. Then 58% of the people have heart problem, 58%, then 31% have arthritis. So all these things are very interesting that by the time you are 65, you have one or other disease. Even though you are very healthy, but you always will carry blood pressure or diabetes or arthritis or something which is, I recently got a text from my niece in Australia and she has a business and there was a 60 year old person and while working in the business he suddenly fell down and his right hand started shaking and he started you know inclining towards right. So because she was pharmacist she realized that this person is getting the stroke. He is only 60 years old but he got the stroke right working and they rushed to the hospital 
and luckily they provided him oxygen and everything very quickly so his damage was prevented so normally for a stroke patient it has around 40 minutes you have so if you can get oxygen to the patient within 40 minutes and the oxygen supply is increased you automatically damage less damage in the brain cells for a heart patient it is around one and a half hours if you get oxygen and get aspirin so they are saying that people above 65 like i am 65 plus so i always carry aspirin and if you take aspirin you can prevent the damage of stroke that is what they say and has been proven that aspirin helps to prevent the damage that this is a simple thing 81 milligram aspirin you carry it with you if you feel like having stroke and it is very easy to know the symptoms of stroke as well as heart attack it's very easy to know when i will show you changing the face of pharmacy you, we have now EEGs and ECGs which you can carry on your cell phone so you can really know an hour before that you are going to have heart attack so the best thing is to go to the hospital but in america it is very interesting if you go to the hospital in ambulance you get preference if you drive your car to the hospital <laughs> you sit in the waiting list so they say that if you have symptoms of heart attack do not drive ask for ambulance and ambulance will come and will help you makes sense yeah makes sense because if you go driving yourself then they don't realize that you are that serious but if you go in ambulance the first thing in ambulance what they do is they put oxygen second thing they do is they put uh, drip so you start getting the drip so you are uh, the saline the saline keeps your ions constant mm. and this is these are the simple thing which can save the damages to the people older people and this is where the interesting aspects which are growing so what is happening is I had shown this, but I'm going to discuss more about this is today is that healthcare worldwide is facing a big challenge all over in all the countries. This is a challenge. The reason is the people who are needing healthcare is growing. People who contribute money to the taxes is going down. The younger people contribute to the taxes. Correct. The older people use enjoy, enjoy the pension. <laughs> <laughs> so they are enjoying the pension for a longer time so they survive for you know they retire at i don't know what is retirement age here 55 58 62 for women for women it is 57 yeah. or there is a discrimination yeah. <laughs> really yeah, yeah. and nobody it's, says anything it's, uh, it's not discrimination but the uh, recognition of for the hard work women so they have to 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 grow the children and also have to work and that's a kind of recognition of that oh. uh, against men that only have to work mostly uh here men don't used to 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 take care of the, the children oh. grow the children yeah mostly the women women take them. so that's why we have five years of difference. But government and women accept it. They like it. Yeah. Oh, 57, they are happy to go and stay at home. Yeah, 57. Oh. My wife used to be professor. She took retirement at around 50. She said, I don't want. Because <laughs> she taught in America. And in America, it's very interesting. I'll tell you a nice story. You'll like it. When I started teaching in America in 1989, my first exam, 70% people failed. And one of the students, she took a delegation of students to the dean, saying that we don't understand his accent, we don't like him, he doesn't know how to teach. And because 70% were failed, so she had a good crowd with her. I, and then she became very good friend of mine, mine. <laughs> Robbie Van Mitteren, I know her name, even I remember now after 40 years. So Robbie took the delegation, so Dean called me and I said, hey, what's the problem? So 
So I said, look, these are my slides. This is my information. These are my questions. Only thing is I twisted the question. And because I twisted the question, they could not understand. And if they don't understand the principles of what I am teaching, then it will be hard for them to answer the question. So then my dean said that, you know, you need to be uh, careful because 70% of the class if fails, how we will run the college? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very interesting. But the healthcare worldwide, it is every country is facing this problem because people who are needing health and every country want to give a reasonable priced health care to all of them. But what is happening is the people who are using the higher amount of consumption of health care funding is growing and who are contributing is going less and less. And that's why the budgets are not managing properly. And it is all difficult to find it out. In India, it's a very interesting thing. In India, they do a lot of operations which are not necessary even like caesarean. You know, the baby can be normally delivered, but they will go for caesarean. And if they go for caesarean, the cost of treatment is very high. And that's where now people are finding out the, how to resolve this. And the second thing is that we need a reasonable healthcare model where spending can eventually be distributed to all the population. You know, younger population don't get money for their healthcare as compared to the older population. And this younger population is contributing, but when they will be old, they will, there will be no money. And that's the challenge which is everybody is facing. So what they are trying to find it out is the alternative. How you can create alternatives so that the healthcare spending can go down. And for that purpose, they are creating model, uh, different types of healthcare models. So here, uh, one is that if you have an informed patient, so if you have an educated patient, suppose the patient is suffering from diabetes, you will see that in last 20 years, there is a lot of information which is shared with the diabetes patient. So that they understand how to deal with diabetes. And if you go to doctors, they will tell you a lot of information now. If you go to any magazine, there will be a lot of information about diabetes. If you go to web search, there is so much of information. Same thing is for everything. And you are, you have raised the increase, raised a lot access to the information because of the WhatsApp, because of the internet, because of the web, uh, website. So the more educated older person is, the more he can take care of, he or she can take care of herself. And this is where the education is playing a major role. So pharmacists, nurses, and now the whole world is moving towards healthcare team approach. Because the doctor doesn't have enough time to spend with the patient. But pharmacist has time. Nurses have time. So they are trying to put up a teamwork of healthcare professionals to make sure that healthcare costs go down. Second thing is that a lot of hospitals are not are doing a day surgery. So you do the surgery, go back home. Like in America now, if they do the knee replacement surgery, by evening you are at home. You don't mm -hmm. stay at the hotel. In other countries, they put them for one, two weeks. In America, they don't do it because the cost of putting a patient in the hospital is enormous, $20,000 per day. So it is very difficult to put the thing. So they are using different techniques, different models, different ways to reduce the healthcare funding and the medical progress is also growing. 20, 30 years back, People, suppose somebody has a pancreas cancer, then it was decided that in three months he is going to die. Because pancreatic cancer, there was no medicine, there was, it was very difficult to treat. Like liver cancer, some of these cancers, once you get that cancer, people used to say that now he is all ready to go to uh, burial ground. Because that was so dreaded disease. But in last 20 years, the researchers have gone so much that even if you have a cancer, you survive for much longer time because the treatment. Mm -hmm. And now the 
cancer treatment in earlier days used to be devastating. Now the cancer treatments have changed. I have a good friend who died of pancreas cancer in Orlando. And then after five years, his wife suffered from pancreas cancer. She is still alive. Because as yesterday we were talking about that investigational drugs. So there are drugs now which are developed nanoparticles which can reach pancreas without reaching anywhere else, without having any other body part. So that monoclonal antibody can take your nanoparticle straight to the pancreas and cure it. So it is very interesting that this lady, in spite of she was she is a doctor, she is surviving. Her husband died very quickly, but she is surviving for more than six years. I know her very well. And this is what is happening. So people, diseases like in good old days, people used to die of arthritis because they cannot walk. Then their life became very miserable and die. Nowadays, you get your knee replacement and you get another 30 years. In 30 years back, people used to die quickly because of the cardiac arrest. Now it doesn't happen. If you get immediate response, uh, medical treatment, they put the pacemakers, they treat those, uh, you know, stains. So once you put stains in the body and remove the plaques, you live another 15 years. The same person would have died 20 years back. Now he lives another 20 years because of the medical treatment and advances in the medical treatment. It is very easy. My friend uh, in India, he had some heart problem. So he was pushing his car. People said that he may die. But he didn't. He went to the hospital and they put like four stents. And now he is perfect. He climbs five stairs and no problems. The stents help them to remove the plaques and it, he was okay. My another friend who used to be provost, he, while giving talk in the university, fell down. But luckily, the hospital was very close to the university. So when they looked at him, they took him to the operation theater straight away because he was a provost and Everybody was knowing. He was a very well-known person in the Denver. So they took him to the hospital. They found out that six of his arteries were blocked. <laughs> so he would have died. <laughs> but then they did an open heart surgery, removed everything, and they put new arteries. He is still alive. He is 91 years old. Oh. And this happened in 1996. I went to visit him. <laughs> so you can see that the technology has changed and you are... Now, and then new chronic conditions are created for medical progress and require sustained care and resources. There is another interesting story I will tell you. In COVID, I, had, I, I used to work for international uh, collaboration group. So I was the chairman of the international collaboration group and my colleague was, uh, she was vice president. So her husband is MDPAD. And he wrote in his will that unless the medical profession fails, they should continue treating me. Now he was 85, 86 years old. During COVID, this has happened one and a half years back. So he, he was in nursing home. So he started feeling like something is odd for breathing. So people thought that he has suffering from COVID. They immediately isolated him, put him into the uh, hospital. Then the hospital said, no, he needs more treatment. So they took him to the bigger hospital. From bigger hospital, they told him that he needs to go for a senior, uh, specialized nursing home. So they transferred him to specialized nursing home. And from there, after three weeks, he came back to his nursing home. And next day, they found that he is COVID positive. <laughs> Going through four places, he found COVID positive. So they put him in isolation and then in, he was okay. Within one month, he had heart problems, so they put a pacemaker. Now he is going to live till 95, because pacemaker, his heart is strong now. So he wanted to talk to his wife and said, hey, today our anniversary, we should go for a dinner. And wife says, no, 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 I don't want to go with you, because it's so difficult to go with you. So you have this problem. This is not a problem, but this is the thing happening, reality of life. And that's why... 
there is a need for how to deal with chronic condition there is a need to understand how to manage these things and how to work with the aging and people are coming up with many different models this is one of the model where we are talking about dietary thing lifestyle change giving the nutraceuticals herbal products exercise schedules and in america now you have several uh, gyms meant for 65 plus so if you go 65 plus don't go to the regular gym because regular gym the trainers are very strong but they go to 65 plus gym so that they can understand the 65 plus you know so life expectancy and healthy aging is growing on and quality of life is also growing on people want to live longer they are very active and they are very productive also so i have a friend who is almost 80 years old even today regularly he publishes and he does good Uh, book editing is still continuing and it is uh, very good for the society because they are useful so you cannot dump them you know they uh, in america there is a very interesting saying they say in the native americans they call it the concept of elders is there <laughs> correct mm. so one white man was talking to the native american he asked him what is this elders so he said that you white americans become old older and useless <laughs> we native american become old wise and elder <laughs> because we are useful to the society that was the joke but you know the healthy aging is a big thing and it is becoming very common now people are enjoying so if you see this a this is a book booklet published by new york city which calls calls aging with dignity so aging with dignity and they have a blueprint of serving the new york city growing senior population and they have various ways of telling the people how to deal with senior people senior people how they should walk around and all those things and now they are creating special pathways for senior citizens because they walk slow so they are creating special pathways for senior citizens in the park there will be people who are jogging and people who are walking senior citizens they have different ways they put nice thing that they are doing but major challenges we have all discussed this earlier so i won't go there into the system people are now doing lot of research work on longevity and vitality and they found out japanese elders in okinawa they do that so they are trying to understand that why they are living healthy for 100 years old and okinawa on an average age is 100 years they live 100 110 115 and healthy not i have seen it in i, I was in israel so in kibbutz in israel i have watch 85 90 years old people they work 8 hours but they don't do the heavy work like driving the tractor in the kibbutz but what they will do is kibbutz is a commune living so there will be a mailing system so every person's mail will be distributed in the different boxes then the clothing is washed together so the city, uh, commune clothes they will fold the clothing like that they are given work so that they will be actively working for 8 hours every day now they are healthy even though they are 85 90 years old they work 8 hours they are productive because they contribute to the society and this is where to utilize their expertise utilize their uh, workforce as a workforce new and new ideas have to come up and see that and that is where so the in okinawa the japanese food this is a uh, system they use they use milk they use fruit they use fish and meat dishes vegetable dishes and grain dishes so you will find that it is going like a reverse pyramid so grain dishes are bigger because they have higher fibers then it comes your vegetable dishes because again high fiber so with high fiber diet and you have fruits at the bottom you have milk at the bottom the fish and meat at the so this way the river pyramid helps them to maintain the health and that is how they survive for 100 110 years that is how they model their lifestyle again there and they use different types of foods and they are making it so what scientists did what they identified the blue zones in the world blue zones are the areas where people live longer than 100 years 
and they identified these blue zone they are in argentina they are in different areas and then they started studying what is the reason so they found out that in europe there are people who live more than 100 years because they are in the hilly areas like you know mountainous area here and they will be climbing the mountains with following the sheep and they will go up and down 100 years but going climbing and coming down no problem so sitting idly in the office doesn't take you longer but climbing the mountain following the sheep it is good so they identified such thing and then they are trying to find a lot of research is going on on this area this is a great area to work in for your phd or in the research there now reducing the chronic burden on public health is a challenge and this is where the herbal products as we have discussed yesterday and deforestation is becoming a one way of resolving this challenge and that's why there is a lot of interest around the world for herbal products and nutraceuticals but now only suppose colombia is not a very big country but you have very good resources so if you want to use herbal products you can use it for your self consumption plus export now as soon as you export you have to have standardization and this is where the people are working on standardization of herbal product nutraceuticals and how they can do it so what today i am going to talk is about how we are going to use different techniques now we did talk about having um, change i told you the cricket game and baseball and all the thing but still we can utilize some modern technique to standardize and this is what we will talk about it today so herbal drugs have a great opportunity and i am just you know uh, i am giving a example of indonesian herbal drug if you see indonesia has one of the very good traditional system jamu and now the lot of products of indonesian herbal drug are marketed globally and one of the best way was the characterization and standardization so they did that and they are coming up with very nice products and they are very good for acute as well as chronic diseases both so they call it jamu and jamu is 3000 years old indonesian jamu traditional medicine are 3000 years old and they are used as complementary and they are trying to grow the market for aging population and for the benefit of the people now if you look at traditional herbal drug used in colombia you must have heard all these thing but the most produced herbs are basil chai dill laurel marjoram mint oregano rosemary thyme coriander sage cardamom am i right these are the thing commonly used here you use it in curry also you, i have seen them using it in my vegetarian food every day in the hotel they do that so uh, these are common medicines which are used there some commonly used healing plants in colombia are artica dayo uh, aika punica grantantum allium sipa zanjibar officiane roscoi curcuma longa and, and these are all manufactured or produced in colombia in different parts of the colombian uh, area there so there are home remedies which are passed down from generation to generation are part of the colombian culture and in the villages they still use this uh, country's diversity offers a rich variety of medicinal plants and according to the popular belief of the ability now there is a lot of opportunities and this is what jamu indonesian jamu did they they took the knowledge and started converting into a product which can be exported standardizing the products and exporting it so jamu is the traditional indonesian system the word jamu means uh, in the javanese and it is derived from javanese culture uh, which says mixing or gathering you know collecting the earth and mixing that is called jamu in their local language and that can be translated as the concoction made by the javanese or the concoction originated from java so this was the old picture you know the javanese lady is selling the products and this is now you know they have different types of concoction and decoction percolation maceration they do very good product they are very tasty and they are very healthy also they use all different types of herbs to prepare those products and nowadays if you go to five star hotels in indonesia they have a separate section of jamu people take it as a daily health 
it's very interesting and I, whenever I go I travel a lot in Indonesia so if the hotel doesn't keep Jammu then I write down complaint that I wanted to get my Jammu I didn't get it so this culture has to be brought in like Colombia Colombia must be having very good products herbal products but in the hotel I didn't see them we need to put them so that it, it is marketing and this is where we need to create some very good presentable nice product to be given and that is what we have to learn from the Indonesia. I have seen that I, I was very impressed with them. So it is predominantly herbal medicine made out of natural materials such as root, bark, flower, seeds, leaves, fruits, materials acquired from animals such as honey, royal jelly, milk, native chicken eggs and uh, are widely used and it is very interesting. They make very good products out of that. Same thing with traditional Chinese medicine also. They do it in Ayurveda is a huge thing in India. It's a multi-billion dollar business in India also. So you will find that this is how Jammu is presented. Very nice presentation, very nice products. You feel like drinking it, yes. you know, the attraction. This is a normal uh, market, flea market. This is the marketed in the uh, five star hotels. So the Jammu is a lifestyle. What they market is that Jammu is a lifestyle. So Colombian herbal drugs can be marketed as lifestyle. And that's where they believed and I'm very impressed with that and they export it a lot in many different countries now as yesterday we talked about the confusion so you have many different like there is a the yogi tea you I, I don't know you, you have yogi tea in your shops anywhere you saw those this is very popular band and they have 100 different teas they call it yogi tea and immune stress and all different types of things are there then there is a the dynamic turmeric which is widely you join food and this food converted into capsules and this is where nutritional supplement healthy food product all these are very interesting but now people are more and more asking because educated people say where is the standardization what is how you are doing it and that's why the challenges of herbal medicine we have done seen that high dose levels with multiple activities characterization, solubility problems, formulation, consistency, reproducibility, lack of analytical implementation for Jammu and herbal products. You know, for the modern medicine, it is very easy. You take aspirin, put it into UV, you measure it. You know, ultraviolet spectroscopy. If not, then you take a drug, put it into HPLC, you measure it. But you take a herbal drug, HPLC cannot measure it. Because herbal drug will have hundred different peaks in the HBLC and that is why I always say that 15 years back when HBLC and all these were not there we were still using this correct colorimeter used to be there like my PAD thesis was mostly on colorimeter and spectrophotometer but I, if today I submit that thesis they will throw it in the garbage they will say that what is this? <laughs> You know, but 40 years back I had good publications out of my thesis and it was international journal publication. But today, but same thing happens with every thesis. Something which is done like 40 years back, if we submit it today, it will not work. I worked in the industry in America. I used to work for a company which was called UCB. And we used to have a product which is a very famous product. I don't know whether you get it here or not, but it is called Tassinex and Delsum. And Tassinex is a very good cup suppressant and it uses hydrocodone, very nice product and it is very effective product. But it was approved in 1974 on one point dissolution data for a 12 hour effect. Now they don't go for again approval for FDA because as soon as they go it will be rejected. But it was still effective, it's more than 500 million dollars worth of product, very effective. But now it, it will not be approved. So this is how the things are changing there and regulatory compliance is becoming more and more difficult for the thing. So standardization of herbal products, how they can be done. So we have to come up with certain physical parameters. So one criteria will be physical parameters. What should be the physical parameters which can be, which show reproducibility of the product. Second thing you have to create are characterizes morphological characterization. What is organoleptical parameters? What are how they look? What is the color? What is the taste, smell? These are 
So you have to create, if, suppose you create a Colombian product, then you have to provide this information that we are using green color, this green, the green is measured in colorimeter or spectrophotometer and this is the range. Now your product becomes standardized. You, so this is how you do, then there are chemical parameters. So you do thin layer chromatography or you do HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography or HPTLC, all LCMS. So for one product you may not have all the ingredients characterized but at least one characterized. So you say we have standardized our product based on this characterization. So that becomes chemical parameters of it. That a particular curcuminoid concentration is achieved. It is 7% okay. between 8, 5 to 10 percent. That's all. Like in modern medicine, uh, I'm sure you must be knowing that when you say aspirin 300 milligram, the FDA allows you to have aspirin 10 percent less or 10 percent more. So your aspirin product, even though it claims 300 milligram, it will have 270 milligrams of aspirin or 330 milligram of aspirin. That is allowed. So the range is 270 to 300. So we need to create such range for our herbal products. It will be acceptable. But if you have one product with only 10 milligram and other product with 1000 milligram, then that is not standardization. And this is where the standardization can be created based on chemical parameters. And then there are biological parameters. So you show in vitro dissolution, in vivo absorption, some sort of kinetic studies and this type of data if you can create for herbal products then it will become a biological standardization. And this is where standardization of herbal medicine is the process prescribing a set of standards. You need to set like for our liquid orals, I am a pharmacist, so for our liquid orals what we say that the viscosity of the product should be between 30 centipoise to 45 centipoise. FDA says good, if, but when FDA comes and if they check the viscosity, if it is 25, they say reject the batch. So you have to create your own SOP, standard operating procedure and standardization, but within the range and that is where the herbal products are near. Then you have to have constant parameters. You know, once you stick to those parameters, once you create a SOP saying that the viscosity of my product will be between 30 centipoise to 45 centipoise, that is my standard operating procedure. Then a batch after batch after batch after batch, your product should have that numbers. It should not be less, it should not be more it, within that range. That is called standardization. And then you have... Pardon? International or it's only American? Stuff? No, it is... Uh, you create your own standards, mm -hmm. but you stick to your standards. And if you stick to your standards, then every country will accept it. But they will ask you how you are defining your standards. Once you say, uh, like, you know, all over the world, if you take a product from Pfizer, everybody takes it, correct? Mm -hmm. Why Pfizer products are taken? Because they use this standardization. And they have a reproducibility of the standardization. You take many different products and you will find that they are there. But still now if you suppose you have a product from America and product from China and product from Colombia, on an average what you will do? You will prefer, you will say that I will go with American product first. This is a reputation. I don't say that it is correct or wrong or right. Then you will say, oh, Colombian, I don't want to take it. I don't know where. We ourselves say that. But this is the difference. That if we create these standards and maintain these standards and show that all the companies are following these standards, automatically it will be standardization. And this is where qualitative and quantitative standardization are very important. And that should give us an assurance. One thing is quality of the product. Second thing is efficacy of the product, third is safety of the product and fourth is reproducibility of the product. So you create the standardization of herbal products and tell that these are the parameters we created which definitely tells you that it is safe, it is efficacious, it is quality product and it is reproducible product. So you have to like you take 
you take the aspirin for headache, correct? Now, from batch to batch to batch to batch, today you have a headache. After one year, you have a headache and you take one tablet from the same bottle, your headache goes away. Why? Because it is safe, it is efficacious, it is safe, reproducible and it is quality product. And this is, this type of strength has to be brought for the herbal product. If we can build up such strength for the herbal product, then automatically it will be acceptable. And that is where the people are now growing. A lot of companies who are manufacturing nutraceuticals and herbal products have this process, standardization of the process. So now here you will find now they are adopting new technologies now. So there is a, a very interesting database which is chemi, chemoinformatics. So you have a database which gives you lot of information about the earth and now you have to identify from that chemoinformatics what will be useful to our products, correct? So now you are using modern technology for the benefit of ancient traditions and this is where chemoinformatics approach is based on structural standards. So you can have most of the plants will have structures already defined. And then you identify those, what is here and keep the constituents, measure the constituents and then come to the range. That like I used to work in a company, we used to manufacture Senna product, that is a purgative, you know, laxative purgative. So Senna, we used to use Senna pods, which is a natural herb, Senna. And then we used to use Senna extract. So now what you do is you make a combination of Senna extract, Senna pods and make a tablet but make sure that each tablet contains 10 milligrams of senocytes. So based on the content of senocytes in the pods or the herb, we will add extract, sometimes less, sometimes more and make a tablet out of it. But tablet will always have 10 milligram of senocyte which is 9 to 11 milligram of senocyte. And that is how you can build up your herbal products with chemoinformatics. In getting all the data, nowadays a lot of data is available. Then there are use of compendial standards. Most of the countries have their pharmacopoeia. US pharmacopoeia is there, British pharmacopoeia is there, Indian pharmacopoeia is there. I think Colombian pharmacopoeia might be there. So every country has its compendial standards, which says, and then follow those standards because that is how government will approve your product there. Then there is a marker based physicochemical assays. So these are some of the assays which you can build up for your herbal products which are biomarker based. So if you take the product, interact with some drug and see that this particular biomarker has gone down. So that is biomarker based and you can do it in in situ with the cells and that is another uh, process which you can do it and then process controlled markers which are in process control markers like when you manufacture tablets you measure the hardness you measure the dissolution time you measure disinfection time like that in control process control uh, um, analytical pro I think pad they call it and that is another area where we can build up during the process of manufacturing then there is storage standards where you should storage it whether it is in cold storage high storage temperature how is the effect of temperature on your product. So there has to be some data to be created that is called standardization of the product. And finally polyherbal reference standards. So if you are using multiple herbs then multiple herbs will have multiple reference standards. And that is where you can build up approaches for standardization of the herbal product. So here are several uh, areas. They call it material characterization. So you can define the ash content, dry ash content, water soluble ash content, these are some of the simple techniques which you can do for characterization of the product. Then there is a physical characterization, then standardization of the thing, biological characterization and microbial characterization. So if you have a herbal product, if you prepare it, then you have to make a microbial study to show that your product is not carrying microbes, correct? Because it is a natural product. And if it is a liquid product, then definitely the macro will grow. We have seen that our bread, if we keep it outside for a long time, fungi grow, 
or different types of mold grow. So in case of herbal products also it is very common. So you need to come up with a microbial standardization for the product. So what is microbial contamination? If there is contamination, there is not contamination. And this can be easily avoided by using good manufacturing practices, clean environment for manufacturing. And that is where pharmacological evaluations are necessary and toxicological evaluations can be done. So you have to do at least one point you give your tablet or your herbal product to 15 rats and check for one month. The 15 rats were taking the herbal product continuously every day and they survived which is a toxicological study. But somewhere you have to show that we have standardized the product, toxicological, pharmacological standardization. So this is where your thing will come. Then there is the physicochemical characterization, color, odor. Have you seen all the vitamin, multivitamin liquid syrups are heavy in color, dark in color? Why? Because there are a lot of interactions happening. So they use the dark color. So you need to make sure that when you use the color, what color you use and what is the concentration of the color and how you can measurable. So now you are characterizing the color of the herbal product. So the color, odor, taste, texture and structure of the product. You have characterization. You can measure surface tension of the liquid. Correct. You can measure viscosity of the liquid. You can measure density of the liquid. These are parameters. Make sense? So for herbal products, like from physics point of view, you have, these are the parameters. You can use them to characterize the material. And this is where the herbal products have to come up with their own standardization processes. Now, good number of companies are coming up and marketing also in flyers that we have standardized. These are our characterization. These are our thing. So that builds up the confidence in your product. And this is where you need to do that. And then... If you can use the advanced techniques like chromatography, spectroscopy, LCMS, at least some study you can show that we used HPLC and we found out curcuminoid content this much and this is our range, standardized product. And people will love it because you have done. So can we adopt, now it is impossible to adopt all of it for every product. But at least some of it should be adopted so that you can claim that your product is safe efficacious, reliable and reproducible. Make sense? And that is where we have to, so can we add up some or all of these characterization and standardization techniques to make herbal as a global product, make your product as a global product. So general parameters to evaluate for standardization of herbal medicines are, one is macro or microscopic examination, identifying the right variety, search of adulterants, all these things can be done under microscope and you can identify those herbal products. Second thing is foreign organic matter. If you remove the matter other than the source of plant to get the drug in pure form. So you have to identify whether you are mixing, like if the people who collect the herbs may not be as trained, so they may, identical herb they may collect. Now that is the identical herb they collect, then that is a foreign matter. Most of the time if you see the vegetables which are sold from villages, it will have some grass and all those things mixed up. And they, otherwise the grocery stores will have to clean it up and do it. So this is the foreign organic matter has to be purified, has to be identified and made sure. Now in modern medicine, we have to show the impurities. Every piece of impurity has to be identified and recorded and shown to the FDA. If your impurity levels are above certain percentage which you claim, then your batch should be discarded. And people lose millions of dollars in one batch. Because I used to work in the industry and our one batch used to be $300,000 one batch. And that was the actual material cost. But the product cost was around $2.5 million. Means you can imagine how much profit was there for the company. But one batch is lost. Material cost 300,000 lost, product cost 2.5 million dollars lost. And this is where this uh, thing were there. Then ash values are another criteria for crude, total ash, sulfated ash, water soluble ash, acid insoluble ash. These are simple parameters which you can do it very quickly. 
and there are now machines available so you just put the sample and you get the data there moisture content is another thing because moisture content directly related to microbial growth and you have to control the micro moisture content of the product so that your product will be reproducible and prevent the degradation of the product then extractive values and crude fibers these are some of the characterization uh, parameters which are used for standardization of the herbal drug then you have qualitative chemical evaluation and this covers identification and characterization of the crude drug with respect to physicochemical constituent it uses different analytical techniques like hplc uv spectrophotometer and isolate active ingredient constituent it involves botanical identification extraction with suitable solvent now you can easily have polar and non polar solvent to find out if the extracts work or not sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't purification characterization of active constituents of the pharmaceutical important then there is the next stage which you can adopt is chromatographic examination using different types of tlc hplc and all those things then quantitative chemical evaluation is another thing which is very reproducible you can use them to see that a particular drug is measured and it is constantly it remains constant within the range and finally the toxicity study uh, to determine whether it contains pesticides residues potentially toxic elements include safety studies in animals and microbiological assays and establish the absence and presence of potentially harmful microorganisms in america we are really having a major problem now because the milk what they drink cow milk is full of hormones Um, it's full of insecticides and full of fertilizers because the, they eat grass and grass is grown with fertilizers because they want heavy weight. Even the beef also they put lot of hormones in the beef, yeah. so the cow becomes really fat mm -hmm. within five to six months. Normally it will take few years, you know, and they put it. But now where these hormones go? They go in the meat. They go in the milk. and nowadays children who are means there is a interesting study which has been reported that in last 20 years the menstrual cycle of the women is starting at early age so girls with 8 years 9 years they start their menstrual cycle because high hormone rate in beef mm. and high hormone rate in milk so now people are saying no 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 we want organic milk we want organic food because you know that is there but there is also you know adulteration always happen but people are facing this problem in america and children are suffering from adhd attention deficit uh, because of some of these food products which are loaded with insecticides loaded with and cancer occurrence is high in the younger population because those who have been con continuously fed on these insecticide loaded food they are prone to cancer at an early age and that is what is challenge so toxicity studies are very important for the herbal drug and obviously if you are organic herbal drug it will price will be very high for that so there is a success story i wanted to share with you is that there is a lady her name is 2 u u i don't know you must have heard her but she got a nobel prize and what she got nobel prize was for artemisinin artemisinin is a herb herbal product which is comes out of traditional chinese medicine and it is very potent anti malarial drug and to you you turn to so she you know she was young scientist and she turned to the chinese medical text from zhao qing and han dynasty to find a traditional cure for malaria So, if you go to North Area, if you interact with the Native Americans here or Native population here, you may find something new drug, and that is what happened in China. So, she came up and she found out this artemisinin, and that has saved millions of lives around the world. Anti-malarial. When she isolated the ingredient, she believed it would work, and she volunteered to be the first human subject. She took that personally, and that is the tradition of China. China has. big tradition of taking the medicine themselves first mm. and they say you know so they say that if i die then society will benefit if i am good society will benefit either way it is 
and then she is the first mainland Chinese scientist to have received Nobel Prize for scientific category. She did do, uh, she did so without a doctorate and medical degree or training abroad. She did not have a doctorate. She did not have any training. Uh, and she got it. So Chinese medicine will help us conquer life-threatening diseases. This is what she wrote. That Chinese medicine will help us conquer life-threatening diseases worldwide. And that people across the globe will enjoy the benefits of for health promotion. So Colombia has a potential because you have a huge jungles. Amazonian jungle is there. And there are people who have been practicing this herbal medicine for years together. So identifying such things and bringing up a product out of that for the global application or global use will be a great, this is a success story of China I wanted to share with you all. So this is how the East wisdom meets the West. So herbal products, herbal drugs and all those things have to be now meeting the West using Western standardization processes and trying to find out how we can meet in between and retain the quality of the herbal product but provide a safety and efficacy of the herbal product and proven efficacy and proven therapeutic efficacy. That is where this meeting of the East and West has to happen. And you, there are several examples here I have. You can study that whole one by one and it will be very useful. That is the Artemisia scoparia. That's how this Artemisin was developed. So now there is a world of caution I always tell our people is that Will it be possible to characterize and standardize herbal drugs or nutraceuticals using the modern parameters used in pharmaceutical products as on today? May not be. But certain physicochemical parameters we can use it. But HPLC may not analyze everything. But in 10 years HPLC will grow. There will be new HPLC technology will come which will definitely be able to help us in characterizing more. Based on the nature of the herbal product with present analytical techniques, it will be hard to characterize every ingredient in the herbal products as it is a combination of multiple ingredients. So we have to come up with some solution for this. At least one ingredient if we can measure, well and good. And do we really need clinical studies for the herbal products as these are used by generation and have been used for millions of people with no specific measurable side effect? This is a uh, big question as I mentioned about rice, bread and salt and all those things. Same question can be there. And what is economic challenges the herbal industry face if we decide to standardize as per the modern medicine now? Now the problem I will tell you, like in Indonesian Jammu, most of the Jammu preparation they do it at home. Whether I had visited a Jammu manufacturing company where there were hens and dogs were going around. So I was little skeptical to drink Jammu from that product company because there were everything was around. So you were not very comfortable. But the same thing if you have been in a GMP manufacturing, you would have taken it, correct? But now if we put all the standardization, this may affect the economy of the people also. Those who are surviving based on providing this herbal drug to villages. Now if you suppose the Food and Drug Admission said no, no herbal drug will be provided without standardization. Then the village people will never have access to herbal drug. And this is where there is a dilemma of the society. And we need to find out the solution for that society. So this I have already talked. So I won't repeat that. I want to conclude with this. I like to quote Robin Williams. Robin Williams is a very popular comedian. And he was Robin McLaurin Williams was an American actor and comedian. Known for his improvisational skills and wide variety of characters he created on the spur of the moment and portrayed on film in dramas, comedies alike and he is regarded as one of the greatest comedians of all time. What he was saying was that I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at the things in a different way. So Colombian people should stand on their desk and look at the things which are available around you from a different perspective. Make sure that you contribute to the world with the herbal medicines and all those things. That's why. So these are all my areas of research. I have already suggested my books and any questions? <laughs> Do you have any questions? Today I covered, we have, I took almost, yeah, one hour. Any questions for me? 
So if you have any question for me, please uh, ask or later. Oh, there is some question. Susanna Fiorentino Gomez. How can we? Por favor. Oh, is it today's question? No. No question. No question. Now you can open your microphone so if anybody has a question. So this was yesterday? Yeah. Go ahead, Susana. Open your microphone. Ah, oh, no, it's not possible. You cannot open the microphone. Anyway, it's... Now you can do it, uh, Susana. No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much. Yeah, wait a minute, please. Hi, how are you? How are you? I can't hear. You can ask her. Okay. Uh, sorry, Susanna. Sorry. Sorry, Susanna. Uh, could you please repeat the question? I was. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Again, please. Hello. Are you now Sí. Now it's better. So we are actually doing the development of uh, phytomedicine for cancer here in Colombia at the Javeriana University. And uh, I am happy to hear that uh, you put all of the standardization methods that we are actually using for that. So Fantastic. taking into account the FDA normative and the EMA in Europe normative, because the normative in Colombia is very bad. Uh, but um, so and actually we have uh, uh, doing two clinical trials in cancer patients uh, with uh, two phytomedicines. So I, I think that we have many things to discuss about that. But I have a question about the normalization. So it's in fact uh, why why uh, you do not propose to do the biological test. Uh, um, for the standardization process, so do the chemical, the chemical analysis, and also a test, a biological test that can be included, because in the FDA normative, I think that it, it is considered. What do you think about that? So, for example, to test one uh, batch for chemi chemical analysis, but also for cytotoxicity or a modulation of metabolic uh, intracellular uh, pathways or something like that. You know, what I am suggesting is that in due course of time, over the period of time, there are so certain objections which are raised by the pharmaceutical industry. And there are people in the medical profession, they always question about the integrity of the herbal products. Because they always look at from their modern medicine perspective. And then they don't accept it. And this was the practice by many medical professionals for many years. Over the period of time, they used to denigrate 
herbal products or nutraceutical they'll say no 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 don't use it and i want to quote a professor from stanford and he wrote a beautiful article and he said that as a medical professional i should not be selective if any pathy which can help my patient i am open to use it so if you look at the western world they try to make sure that traditional medicines will not be practiced chinese medicine not allowed ayurveda not allowed the traditional systems of medicines which were practiced in many different countries they didn't allow it even the acupuncture acupressure all these thing nowadays people are adopting these alternative medicines and i don't want to use the word alternative because these were existing much more than the modern medicine you know this alber medicines have been existing for thousands of years as compared to the modern medicine but the objections which have been raised by the modern medicine physicians or modern medicine practitioners are now accepting that we should adopt this and in order to satisfy them or their curiosity or their expertise we can definitely come up with certain standardization processes like in uh, yesterday i was telling that in i am in tampa florida and right next to my university we have one of the best third best cancer treatment hospital which is known as moffet cancer research center and moffet cancer research center now is doing lot of researches on anti cancer drug in collaboration with natural anti inflammatory herbal products and they are using curcumin they are using lipoic acid glutathione all different types of uh, squalene so these are some of the natural herbal drug they are trying to use it now in order to use that they are trying to also characterize them with their process but there is a requirement that sometimes uh, this type of facilities may not be available in all the countries and in all the possibilities and in such scenario if we push for this type of standardization and characterization and spreading this word that herbal drug do not have clinical thing then that will be hurting the population which is using this in the villages in the rural areas where no other facility is available and that is what my take on this i am not against standardizing i am not against these studies but we should not prevent the use of these medicines just because we do not have clinical studies reported that is my take on this does that make sense yes but in fact we we are working in this for example in vitro in the study of the synergy or antagonism of these natural products together with the shem chemotherapy yeah and we have very uh, interesting results show that it depends of the cell of the tumor cell or of the microenvironment uh, that you can use both uh, together so yeah. it is not necessary uh, so you can conclude that you can use both of the medicine at the same time yeah in, in a tumor or in another one yes so So that you say, uh, I am, I am, agree, I, I agree, but not completely. Okay. But uh, my question was regarding the standardization of the extract. So I understand that that you want is that the people use the traditional medicine together with the the chemotherapy. Yeah. Or with the chemotherapy. Yeah, but, because uh, um, I I think that that is not so sure. Maybe. We have... Because sometimes there is the inhibition of the cytochromes and the processing of the medicament into the cell is inhibited by the by the polyphenols or by the natural products. So there are plus and less <laughs> about that. Now I agree with you, and we I agree and disagree both. I Means. Oh. you are correct from your perspective and i think i am correct from my perspective so we have a disagreement but there are now us patents issued 
for a combination of herbal drug and the anti cancer drug there are several us patents are issued now the what my perception is that suppose big pharma companies enter in this business and they try to monopolize this business then who is going to suffer it is the common man on the road will suffer because the cheaper options they may not have it's like a uh, as i was mentioning last yesterday that pfizer company's one product was lipitor it was 18 billion dollars now that lipitor product has come out of chinese red yeast rice i don't know have you heard about that so chinese red yeast rice has an ability to reduce the cholesterol if you eat that chinese red yeast rice regularly in your rice in your life as a lifestyle so what american did was they banned the import of chinese red yeast rice in 1990 in united states and then merck came up with first product which was lipitor simvastatin and that's how this whole herbal drug was exploited for the benefit of certain people in china chinese red yeast rice is widely used regularly cost not even 1 cent to maintain the cholesterol but it is used by the lipitor and made 18 billion dollars out of it so i think uh, my take is and i'll give you a good example in new zealand there are people known as maoris and now maoris have a resolution passed that if they any world pharmaceutical industry uses the maori herb they have to give royalty to the maori community so tomorrow if you find some herbal drug from the native americans in the nevara or north colombia area and if that is taken up by the pfizer and they make the money and these people stay poor so that should not happen so we don't want the herbal expertise should be exploited for the benefit of few people but it should be given to all the people and uh, made available to all the people the science what you are talking about chromatogram uh, all the cytochromes and all those thing is growing every day it is coming up with new and newer thing and we are trying to find out new and newer thing whatever it was applicable 10 years back and i can provide you lot of data on products which are approved by fda and then withdrawn in 2 years because of the side effects and uh, deaths of the patient who took it so obviously science is also developing and we need to utilize as much as possible but should not prevent the access of herbal medicine to the common man on the road that is my take in this that's all okay, okay. we will now encapsulate the books yeah okay. no problem i agree to disagree no problem i have no problems with that thank you susana for your Any questions? There is another question in the chat. I'm going to translate it because it was written in in Spanish. Is it possible for a pharmaceutical uh, anxiety product to be recognized or approved by the OMS um, because of the millennium uh, use and efficiency uh, in the case of our our native americans uh, without having uh, a data standardization procedure you know that is what today we were talking about is that if you come up with certain standardization because unless there is a standardization if you are producing herbal drug from different areas different regions and when you bring all those together and put up a herbal product you need to have some criteria to make sure that it is safe it is efficacious it is stable and it is reproducible so if we want to have these four criteria for any drug herbal drug or normal drug whatever you want to call it, this has to be done at some point somewhere in some or other way it may not be fully possible now but in another few years it will be possible it takes only technology like nanotechnology you know 
there were no ACM, nobody even thought about nanotechnology. But now it is available, so in 10 years things will be different. Thank you very much. There is a last question from Chamorro. How to teach or influence others to use natural and ancestral products as healing medicine? You know, it all depends upon the mindset of the people. Today, the mindset of the people is that unless it is a well standardized product, you don't take it, correct? That is the mindset. So you want to go to the shop and there are people, this mindset has been created with so strong marketing that there are people who will not go for generic product. They will say, I want only brand product. Do you have people like that? They go only for brand product from big company, big yeah, companies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They don't want generic product because that is how the marketing has been done. Now, if you come up with a nice system where you have standardized products, they are safe, they are efficacious, they are reproducible, and they are presented properly. The most important today is how you present them. If the presentation, I don't know, I gave you product, correct? Yeah, yeah. Do you have those products yeah, here? Yeah. Oh, at home. I have given him some products, which are herbal products. But if you take, if you look at those products, you will say, oh, I must take it because it looks good. It is presented properly. It is in the form of a person tablet. So you need to create such a pathway for these medicines so that they will be useful to the society. But remember that the world is not rich. I always believe that world is not rich. Everybody is not rich. There are poor people also. They deserve mm -hmm. to get something which is for their treatment and in such scenario we need to find out a middle way where mm -hmm. they will have accessibility but they will have better quality that's all thank you very much i don't know if we have any other question nobody else okay say, say goodbye again yeah thank you